and speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So I heard the story of a professor in England who had just written this new groundbreaking book in the field of chemistry. And he was scheduled to do lectures all over the UK. So his university paid for a driver to take him to all of his appointments. And over the course of the summer, he presented this same lecture to the driver, it felt like, a million times. Every time it was the same, he'd pick him up, then he'd drive him to his lecture, then he'd get the free meal and sit in the back and listen to this complicated discussion of chemistry. And so the last night had arrived, the 25th lecture of the summer, and the driver had picked up the professor, and they were on their way to the lecture, and he said to the driver, you know, I think I've heard you give this so many times that I could give that lecture. And the professor was taken aback. Are you kidding me? This is complicated stuff. This is chemistry. You know, no offense, you're just a driver. No offense, but I, you know, I have two PhDs. This is big stuff. There's no way you could do it. And the driver said, do you care to make it interesting? <clears throat> I'll bet you a hundred pounds I could give your exact lecture and no one would know the difference. And the professor was actually bored of doing the same thing every night in the summer. And he decided, okay, let's make this interesting. And he said, you're on. So they pulled over on the side of the road. The driver gave him his hat. They traded coats and they headed for the lecture. The Professor pulled up the car, he opened the door for his driver, he escorted him, and he announced his presence. The whole room stood to applause, and after the dinner, the professor driver got up to speak. And it was brilliant. It was every word of this professor's speech, even down to the jokes. He had it perfect. And when he finished, the crowd arose for a standing ovation. Greatest chemistry lecture they had ever heard, which wouldn't be hard, you know, to do. <laughs> he only made one mistake. He went too fast, and there was time for questions. <laughs> and so the MC called upon the first person to ask a question, and he asked him this long, complicated question based on some of the formulas he had presented in his lecture. And the driver was sitting there thinking, I really need this hundred pounds, really bad. What do I do? What do I do? And then he had a flash of brilliance. And he said, that is the stupidest question I've ever heard. In fact, I've never heard a more stupid question. This question is so stupid, in fact, I'm going to ask my driver to come up here and answer it. <laughs> you see, we all would like to think that we are indispensable. That no one can do the job that we do quite the way we do it. That no one could come in and fill our shoes. No one could do it just like we can do it because we've found our purpose. Maybe. Today is Youth Sunday. Today we're going to honor our 13 year olds as they move from childhood and begin their journey to adulthood. And it's a beautiful thing. But you will be going to school soon, and you'll be asking this question, because it's a question all of your friends will be asking. What is my purpose? And we're Americans. We're radical individualists. We all believe that we're going to get our 15 seconds of fame on YouTube, right? Or maybe on American Idol. And we're all looking for that special thing that just we can do, that will make us fulfill our purpose, will make us find meaning, will be that thing that gives us a happy life. Well, maybe it's not like that. Maybe that's not the way it works. You know, we tend to think that God is this guy that's around to rob us of our fun. 
that God is trying to take away our individuality. That God is here to make us less of us than we could be if we could do whatever we want. And that is not the image that we see in our gospel reading this morning from John 15. He says, you are a branch, and I am the vine. You are a branch, and I am the vine. So let me just ask you, what do you think is, and I'm asking you guys here in the front row, what do you think is the purpose of a grapevine? To grow grapes. Good, good answer, Olivia. That was Daniel. Oh, Daniel. Good job, Daniel. To grow grapes. You're right. That is exactly what a grapevine's purpose is, to grow grapes. And they're so good at it, and growing grapes takes so much energy that without careful observation, a grapevine will put out so many grapes that they're small and gross and no good, and they'll put out all these vines and they'll go every which way, and some of them will go into the shade where they can't get energy, and eventually the grapevine will die unless there's pruner who knows all about the grapevine. And he knows, or she knows, that the grapevine's purpose is to grow grapes. And she knows that that grapevine has it within themselves without us doing anything. And it will grow grapes, but it won't grow the best grapes that it can if they don't cut off all of those branches that are growing into the shit. If it won't, if it puts all of its energy into producing useless offshoots, it will be useless. <coughs> but a properly tended vine can last for a long, long time, and it can produce amazing grapes. What if that's the way our purpose works? What if your purpose? And your purpose, and your purpose, is just to be the best Tiani, the best Allison, the best Tom, the best Rocky, the best Crystal, the best Mike that we can be. And we might be that person whether we're an engineer, or whether we're taking a break to clean floors, or whether we're working in a factory. Maybe that thing that's in you to give you that purpose really is there pretty naturally to live and glorify God in your life, and you just need a little pruning every now and again. You just need someone to keep your vines from growing into the shade. You just need someone to make sure your vines are in the sun growing well. So I have a stick here. I had this great plan that I was going to get a grapevine that I failed. But I have a stick. So let me ask you a question. What can we do to help this stick find its purpose? What can we do to make it bear fruit? All of us in this room, with all of our combined efforts, with some of the smartest people in Shawnee in this room, there is nothing that we can do to make this stick bear leaves or bear fruit again. Nothing. We could glue leaves to it, right? We could glue grapes to it. We could make it look like it's bearing fruit. But it will never bear fruit again. Why? Because it's detached. From the branch. The water that it needs, the community of branches it needs, the soil, the connection to the soil that it's need, that it needs, all of that was found in the branch. And so really now that it's not on the stick anymore, it's kind of less itself, is it? Not more. It's not everything it could be. The good news is, we have a God who's full of grace. And he knows how to take 
dead branches and attach them back to the vine. He knows how. He's done it a lot. And the other good news is, is that it doesn't really take any work from me or you to become who we are in God's eyes, that person that loves their neighbor as their self, that knows about self-sacrificial love, that knows what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to find ourselves. It doesn't take much except for what Jesus said, to abide, to rest, to relax, to remain. You will bear fruit by resting in God and in among God's people. You will bear fruit if you abide.